How's everyone doing? Good. good. Okay, good. Who is here for the first time at work camp? That's awesome. That's great. And who's been at work camps before? All right. So you guys were the experts. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be talking today about how to make your WordPress site multilingual. And these are the things that we're going to be talking about today. Why would we make a multilingual website? Um, what is a multilingual website? Number three, how do you turn your, web, your WordPress site into a multilingual site? And then number four, I'm going to give you some guides about maybe how you can get there as successfully as possible. So who am I? <laughs> so my name is Denise Van Der Cruz. Um, my experience is I've been a coder, a WordPress freelancer, I've worked at Microsoft, I've worked all over, um, I've had my own business and I've been a software engineer. And now I work uh, for w, uh, makers of WTML um, and Toolset, and those are plugins. Um, that sit on top of WordPress, and WPML in particular helps to make WordPress multilingual. And all of those dots on the map are where you will find um, on the those systems employees, right? So we have no physical location. We're all over. We're usually with uh, our employees. The first language is not English, so we're very global. So languages on the internet. Um, English is still the number one language on the internet. English is a global language. Um, but um, other languages are becoming, are, are actually gaining in on English, if you can see um, how that's happening there. Um, with Russian, German, Japanese, Spanish, and French. Um, and <coughs> The, uh, as um, multilingual grows on the internet and the languages on the internet grow, um, people are going to expect to find content in their language. Who here speaks a language other than English? Awesome. Um, so you know what I mean. And who here has English, has, has a language other than English as your native language? Exactly. Um, I live in Vienna. And when I'm looking for content online, um, although I speak German, um, especially when I first came and I, I didn't speak German, um, it was, you know, I was way more likely to stay at a site and, um, and click through on a site that was English. Um, and, and that's how most customers work. They really want you to meet them where they are. And want, they want you to meet them at the language that they are. So what is multilingual? and what is not. Now, I'm sure you've seen this on the left. Um, this is kind of this having this side-by-side -side translation. So you've got one column with all of your English text and another column with all of your Spanish or German text, right? <laughs> um, and um, people do that because it's very simple. You can go into um, the Word, WordPress user interface, type your text, you translate it, and then you type your Spanish text, and you have it all there for you to see. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about later why that's a problem. Not, you know, for web standards, for the user, and also for you in your WordPress process. Um, and then on, on the left-hand side, you have this uh, G translator switcher. So there are these automatic uh, switchers where you can have a, like a machine translation. So Google translates the site for you, or something translates the site for you. And um, if you've ever lived in a country where you know, your language is not the native language, these usually end up to be pretty funny, you know? <laughs> when the machine decides the appropriate translation is not, not usually um, the most appropriate. So those two, just so that we're clear, are not multilingual. 
These are two examples of what multilingual is not. So the benefits of having a multilingual site, and you guys can probably think of some benefits that I don't have on this slide. On this side, slide, I'm sorry. Um, so for the site owner, you've, you've got more customers, you've got a professional image, you've increased your visitor's trust, and you've got higher search engine vis visibility. So that means more users coming to your site. Um, and for the developers, do we have any developers in the room? Awesome. Um, so you eliminate showstoppers. Like, you know, if you've ever worked with international clients, you know sometimes there are some roadblocks that that you that you hit up because you're not coming to them in their language, and you know they're having to do a tremendous amount of work to even understand their own site. Um, and you increase your range of services. So if you can say to your clients, well, and then, you know, I have this multilingual site, I can train you on how to use it, um, it's easily updated, and then you pass on this value-added site to your, to your clients. So it has a tremendous amount of benefits on, on both sides. Who can think of some other benefits? Anybody? Um, I could probably think about some, some other benefits, but um, I think this basically covers it. Um, and and as, as a mostly website user, you know, more than I build sites, I go to sites and I visit them, and I just love having the ability to um, switch between languages and find, some, find, find the language that is most comfortable for me, depending on what the site is. So how do we do it right? I gave you guys an example of what multilingual is not. So then how do we do it right? So there, there are a tremendous amount of ways that, that you can do it right. With WordPress, um, how many of you are familiar with um, WordPress multi-site? Right. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, WordPress multi-site is uh, that I can have a WordPress installation and then I can have many independent blogs within that same WordPress installation. And depending on how I set it up, the word, each blog can have its own subdomain or each blog can have its own folder, right? And there are some people that choose to do multilingual that way. They have these independent blogs in a WordPress multi-site installation and they give each uh, folder or subdomain its own language. So en.mydomain.com would be uh, English, and then es.mydomain.com would be Spanish. And then the user can switch between these two sites. Um, and this is, this is a really great way to do it. Another way to do it is, you know, you can have two different domains. So mydomain.com and mydomain.au for Australia or something. And go ahead and have each one of those domains have their own um, language associated with that domain. And that's really helpful because outside of the US, uh, for example, in Austria where I am, uh, most of the sites end in .at, and so it's understood that if a site ends in .at, then it's a different site. Um, and so that could be really helpful. But what you see here on, on, on this uh, website is that you're on this page and it's very easy to switch between the languages. And when you switch between the language, ideally what happens is that you not only go to the language you switch towards, but you've gone to the language that you switch towards on this page. So that you're not going to like a French homepage now and starting from scratch, like where did I navigate to? but you're going to uh, end up in the French page where you, from that, that corresponds to the page that you were switching from. Yeah. Uh, how would you allocate a situation where the, uh, you know, you said about the country-wise, you have mm -hmm. a subdomain pointing to country. Is that because the language of that country is different? Is that the object you would do? Or the business nature of that country? 
you know, considering an example, just an example of uh, going to my country, of India. Mm -hmm. And we have like, you know, maybe 40 languages. Mm -hmm. uh, so, would you, would you try, how would you, if you go to the extent of catering all the customers, all the audience, mm -hmm. how, how the architect you would think? There's one way is simple, to go on the website, give you the option to translate the website, mm -hmm. so you don't have to think of multiple domain and that feature of URL, mm -hmm. versus having the same domain, where you have the option of translating the website on the file right away. So the people don't have to literally know the different path to see what right. they do. That's a really good question. Um, when you have a relational website, um, do, do your Indian customers have to know that it's a different domain? Do they have to now be, understand which domain it is that they need to go to? Mark, you know, exactly. Sure. And when you have a relational website, they would go to yourwebsite.com, and yourwebsite.com would tell them where to go, either through automatically directing them there based on their location, or um, it would have, you know, India here, like our Indian flag, and they click on it and they go to where they need to go. So there's not this like, I have to know all of these domains and so on and so forth. But what, it, what having these separate domains allows you to do, we'll get to SEO a little bit later, that's one of the best SEO solutions, but then also it's one of the best marketing solutions because having that separation is very good for your marketing. Does everyone understand what I just said? He was asking about, you know, when you have these separate domains, um, does it confuse the customer? And my answer was basically that when you have a site, multilingual site that's set up correctly, it's going to be very relational. So the customer only comes to your central domain and, and is able to be directed to where they need to go. They don't have to know the exact domain or anything. So how do I make my site multilingual? So first, you choose your solution. Um, second, you're going to install and configure. Uh, you're going to insert your language switcher, whatever that looks like, if it's flags or, um, or just you know, the, the, the country maps uh, or just uh, the language written out. There are different ways to do that. Um, you're going to translate your content and you're going to then, and this is the part that a lot of websites fall on, and that is keeping it updated. So number five relates to number one, because if you have a solution that is clunky, it's hard to use, it's hard to figure out, your client isn't clear how it's going to work out, number five is never going to happen. And I'm going to say honestly, it is really, it is better to just not have a multilingual website than to have a multilingual website where the Spanish is from 1994 <laughs> and the English is from last month, right? Because that, that feels really bad for your, your, span, your potential Spanish customers, right? So keeping it updated is essential. So you have to pick a solution that works for you. Does anyone know of potential um, multilingual solutions besides, of course, WPML? Um, does anyone know of any others? Something that you feel extremely comfortable with 
And we're going to talk about, um, later on in the presentation, about all of the things that your solution should do so that your site is going to get the attention it needs from your clients and from Google and so on and so forth. And, and very importantly, be up to standard. Okay, so what Google needs? Um, Google needs you to have one language per page um, uh, because they filter their search results based on languages. And so if you've got that side, remember that, that slide in the beginning, that side-by-side -side -side translation where I've just put my English in one column and my Spanish in the next? That's really confusing for Google. Google doesn't like that at all. They need you to have cross-links between translations. Right? So they want those pages, the Spanish page and the English page, to be relational. And so they want them to have tags in the HTML that says, and if you want the Spanish of this page, here is the HTML, uh, the URL for the Spanish page. And, and vice versa for the English page. So they, they need those uh, cross links. They want you, they, they, you know, they have various uh, algorithms and stuff to try to make sure that you've used a human translation. So this is where the machine translation comes in, and the bots, and so on and so forth. Not only are they terribly inaccurate, like, as I, so now I, I speak Spanish and German and, and I'm learning French. And of course, <laughs> as, as a native English speaker, I, I just want to like take out the dictionary and do these one-to-one -one translations. <laughs> And it just doesn't work. Um, and it leads to very funny situations. Um, they want the translations to have their own URL. This is another reason why the machine translation and the side by side translation doesn't work. Because they're not distinct, they don't have their own URLs. And they want um, you to update the translation. As you know, as many of you know with Google, they are always looking to see what kind of content is active and live and dynamic. And so when you're updating those translations, that helps your rankings and your pages build upon each other. Okay? So having a multilingual website is really awesome in terms of having a reference for your main page and the pages will build off of each other if you keep them up. And here are some tools for multilingual SEO. Um, both All-in-One SEO and WP SEO um, really do a great job at making sure that they're uh, compatible with most of the uh, multilingual WordPress plugins and uh, do a great job of making sure that you can specify the SEO um, parameters not only for your main site but also for your translated site. And here's a list of elements that we have to translate. And usually people understand that they have to translate the first and the second element. So they know, okay, my site title has to be translated. They know that my pages and my posts, of course, that content should probably be translated. But sometimes people forget that the categories and tags, the images and menus, the widgets, the custom post types, the custom fields, the theme localizations and the theme options, these are all things that have to be translated. And especially if you're a developer, and especially if you're handing off a project to a non-native English speaker or someone that speaks a language that you don't speak, having all of these elements translated into that person's language is going to be absolutely essential for that update part of, of the puzzle. Are there any questions? Are we going too fast? Everything's good? So, for different kinds of users, uh, you're going to have different needs, right? So your site visitors want it to be comfortable, um, understand everything, your content editors um, need it to be quick and easy, and they want to think, you know, they don't want to think about, like, uh, do I need a line of code in order to translate, or do I need to now you know, take a PHP course in order to translate? You don't want that to happen. Um, your developers, as developers, you need to know how quickly you can do it, and which elements to handle. And the Google bots uh, need to know that they can recognize the languages of your page and that it's done by a human. 
And so whatever solution you choose, you have to make sure that it hits all of those spots. So um, you have to either be very comfortable if you're the site owner, or if you're handing off a site, you need to be very comfortable teaching your site owner how to translate. That is essential. So can you copy from your original? Because sometimes, of course, with certain translations, like if you have an image gallery translate, if you have an image gallery, that doesn't necessarily need to be new content. So being able to copy that information into the new uh, translation, translation and then maybe change some of the elements from there is very essential. So can you change your admin language? Can you translate the images? And can you synchronize the menu so that all of these pages are relational and all of the same options are there for all of the languages? Um, how do we easily update translations? The idea is to have a translation workflow, and what that means is that this, uh, you know, for, for, for many of you that are making sites, given how many of you speak languages other than English, I, I take it that you would be the one doing the translation, right? Are there some of you that are thinking of having a site where someone else does the translation? Right. And so when you're adding someone else into the mix, having a very clear process is absolutely essential. So you want to make sure that they can come into your site, have access to what they need to have access to, translate, and then have it appear where it needs to appear. So that translation workflow of I've made the content, um, my translator has an automatic notification that I want them to translate it. They can come into my website, you know, have a screen that is exactly what they need to do. Here's my original. Please translate here. And do it and then upload it with ease. That's very essential for translators because translators are not necessarily WordPress developers or even that clued into how WordPress works. So having that UI be very simple is so almost all of the major theme companies are now multilingual ready. This, this um, logo right on top, multilingual ready, that's what a theme would have if it's something that could be used in other languages other than English. Yeah? Is that list on the website anymore? Um, it's not an exhaustive list. Okay. This is just like a, a representative list. Like, there, there are tons more, right? Um, but when you are picking your solution, so um, when you pick your solution, you should make sure that when you are looking at a theme to fit that solution, that the theme says, we support your solution, right? Like, whatever your multilingual solution is. So you, you need to make sure that you're your theme says we support WPMF, or we support Key Translate, or we support Polyline, right? You need to make sure that that happens. Because I've seen it time and time again that people want to have a theme, and then they want to have a solution, and they haven't thought about those things before trying to bring those two together. And when it doesn't work, it, you know, of course, it's really frustrating because usually they're figuring it out at a point when they've invested a lot of time and customizing the theme and, and figuring that out. So before you invest the time in your solution or your theme, make sure that you're dealing with a solution that has a wide array of, uh, of themes that it works with. This is not an exhaustive list, I'll say that again. There are tons and tons of themes uh, that are multi-memory ready. I could not keep them <laughs> in the slide. So. But if you see this logo on a theme, then you know what that means. And if a, a theme doesn't say it's multilingual ready, then it probably is not. Because if they are, then they, of course we want to advertise. <coughs> so who here um, has had uh, or wants to have an e-commerce site? All right, and. Um, who, what 
solutions were you guys using? WooCommerce. WooCommerce, right. So WooCommerce is probably the most popular WordPress solution um, for e-commerce. And the idea is to make sure that your, um, your solution is, of course, compatible with your e-commerce solution. Because more than anything, one of the biggest motivations for becoming multilingual is to have multilingual clients, to have that be a revenue stream. And in your shop, you want to make sure that you're meeting people at the language that they feel most comfortable. Here are some examples. We're getting near the end. Are there any questions? Okay. Here are some examples of some multilingual websites. Um, this one is SkypeEnglish.com, um, where they do English lessons uh, on Skype. And you see they have all of the flags up on top there. And depending on what your language is, you can pick uh, one of these flags and, um, and have it be, come up, show up in your language automatically. And then here's another one that's a very different kind of site. It's like more of a fashion blog. And this has also kind of the, the flags, but of course they've customized the flags, they look kind of cool. And the, the great thing about this one is that um, all of the all of the actual content is translated. So as a user, I don't feel left out when I've actually clicked on that American flag and I have no content there because none of it's actually translated. And then here's an example that is a WordPress, and it's a major corporation, it's Nike, and they have the same thing. It doesn't look very different. They've got, they use flags, and they have, um, they have it designated based on, of course, country, more so than language, and then they've associated languages with the country. And that's another thing that you can do. Instead of, uh, in addition to having um, languages be the main designator. You can have, um, I've seen um, websites where they have UK English, and then they have Australian English, and then they have um, American English. And they, they're not doing that because we don't understand each other's English. They're doing that um, because they have different content to, to show to those audiences. So you can use a multilingual solution where you have these relational pages so that you're showing um, catered content to different kinds of audiences. So that's, that's another thing to think about. So summing it up, um, choose how to do multilingual, get a convenient translation workflow, optimize for search engines, and feel free to build e-commerce Sites. And now I have a bit of um, a prize for anyone that can answer a question. Um, you'll get one, one license to everything off. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, uh, oh gosh, the question. What is the question? <laughs> to be um, a question that I didn't cover because this was a, this was a pretty basic uh, presentation, uh, but I'm sure that there are some of the developers that may know this. Um, for, if for a theme to be multilingual and to be able to be translated into other language, what kind of file would it have?
.mo or .po files, what the theme developer would have done is put all of the text strings of the theme um, in a format such that it could be translated into different kinds of languages. And so that that is exactly the kind of file that it would be. Yeah. So the uh, I, my question is very much related to it is that you are saying the uh, multilingual uh, ready themes. Mm -hmm. So in other words, those themes are ready to accept the dot and all. And where can I find a tutorial? On how to make your theme multilingual? So are you interested? Are you a theme developer? No, I'm not. I'm user as a user. As a user, my my site to be multilingual. Okay. I mentioned before that it has to be uh, Google likes to have separate URLs. Right. Which means separate domain names to begin with. Right? Yeah, so that that's actually that's that's the best SEO solution. In addition to that, I need um, a multilingual uh, capable theme. Mm -hmm. So, and then to apply the how, how, how is that? How do I connect to that? Mm -hmm. not, so being, the, the, not knowing anything. Exactly. So, the, the way that you connect to that is to not do the theme developer's job for them. So, you make sure that they have that logo that says multilingual ready. And you make sure that in their documentation, in their, their purchase, their sales document, they should say, we are compatible with such and such solution, whatever multi-level solution that is. Okay? So once you, like if you've chosen to use WPML, you need to find a thing that says, we are compatible with WPML. And they would state that clearly. Right. And then the next step. And then, and then the next step is then you get your theme, you get your solution, and you customize your theme, usually in the first, your default so language. in English. Yeah, so if you want to start in English, you can do it in English. If you start in English, everything's in English, you've customized your theme to have all the content that you want, and then you install your solution, and um, and then you translate all of your English content into the other languages. Yeah, and then you would translate it into the other languages. Then why do I need a, if I have a separate domain and a separate URL, why do I need to do that? Because, um, let's say you have an about page. You want that about page, what would be your second language? Uh, Chinese. Chinese. Okay. <laughs> so you want your about page to be relational, your English about page, to be relational to your Chinese about page. Okay. I mean, the, I see what you're saying. Right. Would be over. Exactly. And, and not only that. So words are different. Yeah. And not only that, you want you want to to have a system whereby you can make sure that you're you're providing uh, similar content for your, for your Chinese um, users. Can you use Yes. Uh, for, well, I mean, I can't speak of the other solutions, but for WPM, I have tons of tutorials, and we can talk about that later. Yep. Right back into your site, and 
that, that's how that works. So it doesn't always have to, and of course you, you can do that outside of WPML, right? Like you can email whichever translator you want, leave information, and then have them send it back to you. So what is, what is WPML going for me if I translate the site? So the, now, now I have a site that's translated. Right. And now it's not putting additional blog posts. Is that why I'm not going to be translating it? Or right? You send it, you have to send it for translation, but if you have WPML, you can do that within this interface. So it's like a couple clicks away in WordPress. Like I've created this contact and I can click a few things and I've sent it to translation. Right? And what the, the, the question what WPML or any other multilingual plugin will do for you is present um, uh, provide you with an infrastructure on top of WordPress that allows you to have these relational translations. Right? Because WordPress out of the box doesn't do you have your yeah, hand. so I was just trying to understand that relational piece. Mm -hmm. So what, what your organization and all of these solutions do is the notion that if you have a page, it's linking to the corresponding pages in the other language, and it's behind the scenes keeping track of which Exactly.
if I give you an email, you can have a splash page or a loop page, right? Like, so have this kind of, um, there's another, I, I put up the Nike example. One of the things that Nike does is when you click that flag, um, since they have so many options, there's not like a drop down that appears that says like English, Spanish, Chinese, and so on. It's like a whole page. And then in that page, it's really simple and it just has your region and your country. And then you click on that and then you come to the content that that is right for you. So you kind of just don't have much much content on that splash page. On, the, on, on that splash page, you can do whatever you want with it. You can have funky pictures, <laughs> you know. It, it so, seems like Google wants you to index something. You know, exactly. That splash page is fine to have that one splash page have the two contents. I mean, like, of course, you're not going to have a ton of content right. on that splash page. It's just like, choose this or this. But then the idea is to have your Spanish loop over here and your English loop over here. That, that is kind of how it's set up. I'm just concerned that it sounds like just having this sentence in English and this sentence in English. No, just, just for one page, it's not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so our, I'm, I think I have to wrap up. What were we looking for? Three? Three. Three. Talk to me about this morning. You can contact me here, or I will be at the Happiness Bar 